Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, today is a very special day. We are, today is the day before Easter Sunday, and we are gonna be talking about the meaning of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The way we are going to do it is that I'm going to invite everybody who's familiar with it, with this theme, to talk about what they understand by it. You can take between five to 10 minutes to talk. Let's hear what everybody has to say, and then we will have a discussion. So, you know, feel free to, you know, express as much as you want. You've got five to 10 minutes to do that. We're going to start with Brian, followed by Victor. Uh, if you'd like to share your understanding of the cross, uh, meaning of crucifixion, meaning of resurrection, go ahead and type exclamation mark, um, and we will go from there. All right, uh, Brian, go right ahead. So I appreciate this opportunity. The, um, I have been reading a lot lately about the death and resurrection. Um, the, there are, there's so many interpretations of it. It's, uh, you know, it's really a focal point in history that's received a lot of attention. And I think uh, rightly so. The, um, you know, honestly, among all the wars and killings and assassinations and the rest, it's wonderful to have such a, uh, a wonderful event that is taken on historic proportions. Uh, usually it's, it's more of the bad news that does. The, um, and I really think it's a, a wonderful story. The, um, some people, uh, there, there's so many different interpretations about the death and the resurrection. Um, some people believe literally, some figuratively, some say it didn't happen at all. Um, some say it happened, but doesn't have such a, a significance. It's so, there's just so, so many. The, um, I guess one thing I would say, first of all, is I find that uh, whatever the facts are, it was, a, it was a, it has become a wonderful event up, uh, into which many, many people over many generations, centuries now, have poured their, their sweetest hopes uh, for themselves and for others and for the future. So it's really just been a, a tremendous uh, receptacle really of all these hopes. And uh, I'm so glad that we've had that, that it served that purpose. The, um, I find that one of the great things for me in the 52 Living Ideas has been recently the introduction to the Tao Te Ching, the uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita. And I, I find that these are uh, work in somewhat the same way where, uh, yes, there was a, they're written differently and there, there are many differences, but people also project their sweetest hopes and dearest wishes onto these writings. And obviously they're, you know, not without reason, but, to me, it's striking how similar the sweetest hopes uh, and dreams of all people around the world are. It really comes out in very much the same place, uh, which includes peace of mind. I've noticed, I've really picked up on that in, in all of these uh, different readings. The, um, so I really embrace the, the Christ story, um, uh, along with these others. And I think the Christ story has things to offer and offers in a different way, obviously offered in a different time and place uh, and has uh, really fulfilled a human, a human need. The, um, you know, on, an, on another level, it's, uh, it kind of brings into the, uh, uh, well, it has preserved, I won't say it brings in, it's preserved kind of a cyclical view of time and life. You know, time might be linear, but life can be uh, cyclical. And 
there's no reason that it can't or shouldn't be. Uh, and that's something that I think is lost in the, the modern world. Maybe it wasn't, uh, I don't know, the Hebrew tradition so well. I've been told that it's, it's not a part of the Hebrew tradition. I'm not so sure. The, um, but it does bring in uh, many, many other traditions that again embody our, not just the, our understanding, the human understanding of themselves in the world, but human, under, human wishes and dreams. And this is true, not just in those three traditions I, that I've mentioned, but I've read a lot of different uh, religions and mythologies that go way back uh, to the Neolithic time. And they all have these same wishes and dreams. So the one thing uh, that, I, that I would say is that I, that I do not share the, the claim of exclusivity that is in Christianity, that Jesus is the only way. I think Jesus is one way to God. Along with all of these others, they all have their own uh, independent significance, their own validity. And uh, in that context, I really embrace the, the uh, cross and the story of the, the death and resurrection of Christ. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian. So folks, uh, who, uh, those of who uh, are coming in, um, the format is I'm inviting everybody to talk about what they understand. May I say one more thing? Please, uh, let, me, let me just complete yeah. this and okay. then I'll hand it back to you. Yeah. Um, so folks, uh, I'm inviting everybody to talk about what they understand by the death and resurrection. What is the meaning of crucifixion? What is the meaning of resurrection? Uh, you can take between five to 10 minutes uh, to talk about it. Um, and we're going to go one by one. Next up is going to be uh, Victor followed by Evanique. Uh, so uh, Brian, please continue. So just to finish that last thought, to me, the fact that the Christ story the death and resurrection, especially the death and resurrection, appears in so many other religions and religion, uh, current religions and religions from the past, does not take away from its validity. It adds to the validity of uh, the story that's being told. And I just think it's, uh, there's something about that story that's practically magical. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next up is Victor. Victor, go ahead. Well, thank you, Shikant. Uh, lovely to see everyone here. I have uh, missed a, a bunch of people here. Love to, to. Okay, so I'll jump in. So this story. So this is actually the culmination of the whole story of Jesus Christ, and uh, there is a reason why we celebrate Christmas and. Uh, the end of uh, his life, the, the Good Friday, and then the rise of Jesus Christ in Easter. So these three are very important points in this story. And I will give an overview of where we started and where we, where we are culminating. According to, well, uh, I should also say this thing. Uh, I have some religious background, but I really hate to look at it from a religious uh, perspective. Uh, I really want to avoid any kind of religion into it. So the way I want to say it from, uh, for the lack of a better word, spiritually. So I think the story actually starts in Genesis where uh, God actually creates Adam and Adam, once the sin happens, Adam is thrown into the world and he's, he's the first Adam and the first Adam sinned and we can take Jesus Christ as the last Adam who did not sin and he is ending the story and by not sinning, he actually is 
taking himself into heaven. So that's the that's the whole thread. And uh, I want to talk about three major points here. So you probably have discussed about the seven words that he spoke on the cross. No, we have I, not. No. Okay. No, yeah. Okay. We have. Go ahead. Okay. So I want to talk about two main things. The first word actually, the first word he speaks about the people who are who don't know what they are doing, and please forgive them. So that is important, and in a in a way that it is a call to say that people are still unconscious in in the behavior and it is uh, a wake up call into coming into consciousness so that's one thing and sixth word actually it's uh, about completing the story the word itself is it it is coming to an end and uh, which also means that the sin that has started in adam it is coming to an end because of his purity in his behavior so that's the second point. And uh, Brian actually mentioned uh, a very good point about people taking it literally and uh, metaphorically. So I'm more on the side of metaphorical idea, not the literal idea. And uh, the whole thing, again, hangs, well, we started with John 1, John 1, and John 1 opens up, opens uh, with this word called the word becoming flesh. I think that is the whole theme in all gospels and especially in john it is that what is word and what is becoming flesh word is something that the meta wisdom that is given to us and becoming flesh is more we behaving it and uh, we didn't have an ideal behavioral character and uh, it is being portrayed in Jesus. And that is how I understand it. And uh, I don't want to take too much time, just I'll wrap it, wrap it up with uh, the word that we are reading right now in, in the essay, well, in, well, in uh, John, I think. It's, uh, there is a paragraph about Gethsemane and uh, where Jesus goes in and he has this temptation to actually avoid what is going to come the very next day. And he goes in and prays for like three times. And that also shows the uh, the temptation that we have as we are performing the best of ourselves. It is always, there is a temptation not to do it. And uh, the idea is to go, go for the best behavior. And also there is another thread in the same story saying that the disciples who is who are following him are actually sleeping. And they are not taking it seriously and he goes back and tries to wake them up a couple of times it is also a very uh, very important idea that it is it is our nature to fall from the best behavior and uh, it is up to us to wake up and uh, be best thank you thank you victor um i want to pick up on a few things um brian did a great job of talking about the sweetest hopes that is the term that he used, sweetest hopes, and the commonality of the sweetest hopes that he sees across uh, all the religions that we're looking at. Um, also, he talked about this being the focal point of, of Christianity. And I think um, Victor's identification of seeing where this arc starts is a very deep one because you can't understand the end of an arc unless you know where it starts from. Uh, so you can see the entire arc. Um, so thank you. Next up, uh, so folks, uh, go ahead and type exclamation mark if you would like to share your understanding of the death and resurrection. We're going to start, uh, we're going to go with uh, Evanique next, followed by Joe and Katie. Evanique. So the way I've always understood well, I'll start from when I'm younger. Um, I was, I was, uh, I went to a Catholic school. Um, I have a Catholic background. So I always knew that Jesus is the hero, right? He's always been taught to be the hero. Um, but I, and he was the hero because he died on a cross for our sins. And in a sense, I think 
it's almost a shame that that's his whole story. Like that's his whole arc because the life he lived before it is amazing, right? And he's teaching us how to live um, a life that is uh, aimed towards focusing on God or focusing on higher power. So for me, the crucifixion is about sacrifice. And it's about sacrifice for the greater good. And it, it it's a little bit, it is a little bit about you, but it's about more than just you. It Jesus sacrificed for humanity, but he realized that humanity is him, right? He's 100% human and he's 100% divine. So in a sense, the sacrifice was for humanity as well as him because he considered himself to be part of humanity. He was the son of man. He said that he was the son of man. And um, in addition to being the son of God. So it was about obedience to his father, but it was also about saving mankind. And I think, I, I you know, whether you believe in the Christ story or not, I think there could be something to be gleaned out of it. Um, I think this resurrection is the payoff. You know, like it, it's kind of like what you get after you sacrifice, what you go through. But when I read this today, um, some points pointed out to me in this story is when the disciples fled. Now, we always just were taught that, you know, that the disciples lost faith or they were cowards or that that was the narrative that was told. And when I was reading Matthew, I think it was, and it said it was talking about the disciples. The disciples fled when they were trying to stop the Roman soldiers from taking Jesus. And Peter cuts off the guys, puts, cuts off one of the soldiers, soldiers' ears. And Jesus tells them all to stop. If I wanted to, I could stop this and I could have 10,000 angels come down and save me right now. But Jesus is choosing this for himself. He is choosing to go to the cross. He is choosing this. And I think there's a theme in that for us is the choice that we make. It sacrifice is a choice. And we in um something Becky said in Tuesday's meetup, why are we sacrificing? Like, why would you make that choice? That choice better be worth it. And are we, and I think if it's bringing you towards your sensor, like we talked about in the Gita, the, the sacrifice is worth it. Um, and that's what Jesus was showing is that it's like his sacrifice is going to bring people closer to God. They still have to choose it, but it's going to bring people closer to God, which is in us, which we see as the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is in us. So in a sense, Jesus, like the sacrifice brings you closer to who you are. And that's what I think the crucifixion story shows is that any type of sacrifice you make. And I think the reason why it's so painful and so torturous is that sometimes those decisions that are painful and torturous brings us closer to who we are. And it may, and it has us figure out who we are. And sometimes we just have to go through it. We all know there are just times in life where there's just gonna be things that are just gonna be extremely painful and extremely hurtful, but it's okay because it's gonna bring us closer to who we are and who we're meant to be. It's kind of like that, um, like the pruning of the tree or the, you know, the gold being refined by fire and getting to the purity of it. So I think that's it. But the reason why I'm pointing out the disciples fled because they, it wasn't that they were afraid at that moment, it's that they didn't want to see Christ go through all that. That's why they were trying to stop it. They were willing to die. Like when you're taking on Roman soldiers, that means you are willing to sacrifice your life for Jesus, right? They were going to sacrifice their lives to protect them that night. So I think the coward, the coward narrative is a little bit off. But when Jesus was like, no, don't fight, that's what they couldn't do. They couldn't not fight. They couldn't just stand there and take it. They couldn't go through the, the pain that they were going to have to go through by watching Jesus die on the cross. And that's what they were afraid of. They weren't afraid of dying themselves. They were afraid of watching their friend die and standing back and letting it happen. 
And I think that's sometimes what we as humans are afraid of. You know, like um, I always say when people pass from this earth to the next and sometimes people don't wanna let go. And you know, they're gonna do all these different things to save them. And knowing full well that that may not be the way the person wants to live. And the hardest thing for them to do is watch it. Or I say it's the equivalent of a mother having to watch her child die and there's nothing she can do. And that is the most torturous thing in the world. And we see that at the cross with Mary watching her son die you know, John watching his friend die in that way. It's the hardest thing. So I think we we avoid the pain. Of course, you're going to avoid pain. You don't want to feel it. But sometimes there's just no other choice. And then the last point, and then I'll stop, is that the part that struck me is that, and I've heard this story many times where Judas asked Jesus, is it me? When he's talking about somebody at this table is going to betray me. And Judas asked Jesus, is it me? Like, why would you do that? Knowing full well it's you. You know it's you. And I think the reason why he asked that, because this is a confession. It's like Judas confessing to Jesus saying, you know, and not directly, but saying, is it me? You know it's you. You've already done the deed. You already have it in your head. It's already done. And so to me, and Jesus says, it is as you say it is. And so like, Jesus like, yeah, I know it's you. And I think when we think about Judas, I, a part of me, I, I'm torn about him. Because in the scriptures, it's, and in another part of the scriptures, it talks about the person that is destined to betray Jesus. It's almost like Judas really doesn't have a choice. And I've always struggled with that. And I still struggle with that. But I think I think maybe that even though that is his role, my question is, could he have changed it? Like in that moment, could he have changed it? Even if he had already did the deed, right? He did already did it. What if he said to Jesus, instead of saying, is it me and being coy about it? You already know you did it. Just, you know, I apologize. And, you know, I, you know, this idea of repentance, and that's what I think it is. It's this idea of repentance. You already know you did it. But if you repent and you just say, you know what, I'm really sorry. I know I set this emotion. I wonder if his fate would have been different. I wonder if that guilt wouldn't have gotten to him as much if he had just said right there at that table, I've done it. And I can't take it back. But all I can say is I'm sorry and be sincere about it. Judas always, I don't know why, Judas always gets to me. And I know people don't feel sorry for Judas, but I always had that little bit of sympathy. It's like, was it his fate just to go like that? And then how can you really be mad if that's how it had to happen? So I think this crucifixion story for me is a story of human beings and, you know, life. We're all going to go through things. We're going to have joyous times. We're going to have times that devastate us. And I think the resurrection is about recovering from that and becoming a better person and allowing what happened to you not keep you in a mode of victimhood or what happened, it's moving forward. I think that's the resurrection story. It's like you've gone through this, you've gone through this. Now you get to move forward with your life and you get to see the beauty of it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Evanique. Um, I mean, there's so many amazing, uh, amazing points here. Um, first, the fact that Jesus is here to teach, to show you what being godlike is. Second is the value of sacrifice, that it is, it is the sacrifice giving up of the peripheral that gets you closer to who you are. And the point about choosing that Jesus actually chooses to, to do this. Um, wonderful. 
Um, so we will have, uh, so folks, um, I invite you to uh, type exclamation mark if you'd like to share your understanding of, of this topic. Uh, we're going to go with Katie, Claire, and Maritza next. Katie. Uh, just a second. Oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead, uh, Katie. Sorry about that. Go ahead. No worries. Um, I think I'm I'm kind of looking at it from the angle. I'm kind of like it's a story. It's a historic practice. It's a symbol. Like if you see people wearing uh, jewelry, like the crucifixion is like uh, a symbol of Christianity. Um, and then my second point, you know, my points are really short, would be just how much it frames time in the Western world. Like if we if we view Jesus's death as like, you know, the it's almost like the start of history, like with like with Anno Domino after after the birth of Christ, how much it, it, it affects our perception of time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Katie. Uh, let me just check with Joe. Joe. Joe, would you like to go now or would you prefer to go later on? I can go. I can go now. Sorry. Okay. I mean, go ahead. I, I no, mean okay. I'll just it's it'll be brief. Sure. Go ahead. Because uh, I have a situation evolving here. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, so for me, uh, but the death and resurrection actually means is it's uh, something, you know, very, very deep. It's, uh, you know, I mean, growing up Catholic, uh, I kind of, you know, lived, uh, this was my faith, and this is what I believed. And I would always think that if God could send his only son, and his son would be crucified, that I could endure anything that was set my way. Um, so it gives you strength in that regard, but it's important to really understand that it, it's not necessarily to look at, hey, what does it mean to take up my cross? What is that, you know, what does that actually mean? And it's not that I'm in a bad situation and it's a form of self-pity either. I think that that's a really important point that people misunderstand about the cross is sometimes as they think of, I'm in this job this is my cross. I'm this. I'm doing this. It's this is my cross that I'm I'm having to bear. Um, that's a form of self pity. That actually is something where you're not necessarily uh, you're using the cross as an excuse. Um, for for me, the cross was something that uh, was you know taking up as essentially the full giving of a self to something. And letting essentially yourself die so that you can actually take up or you know, uh, become something and transform into something new. You could follow Christ. And any sacrifice in that process is possible. So the dying of oneself, that's the key to really kind of focus on when I think about the cross is not necessarily the uh, you know, the acceptance of where you are in life, but to, um, to surrender to Christ. When I was growing up, that was essentially it. And if you take it, you could take this as Victor had mentioned, metaphorically or, or literally. And, and you know, the, are you willing to make the sacrifices that are necessary to follow Christ? Are you willing to, um, you know, uh, uh, if it means the alienation of your family, if it means the the uh, loss of your reputation, uh, if it means the you know you lose your job because you know you, you're doing the right thing, if uh, means losing uh, losing your life in certain cases, many of the early Christians absolutely did lose their lives, uh, and, and uh, especially in early Roman times. So that to me is what it really kind of means is that that's where the sacrifice comes in. What are you doing in order to let, to give totally of oneself to God or to whatever you wish to become. And that's the transformation that kind of takes, that, that does take place. 
Um, and I do think it's important to pro like, and we can go through the whole story together, but the story is absolutely incredible. And I think actually Evanique hit on one of the most important points and is that of the mother uh, in, in, in this role. And, you know, I remember one time I was at a funeral uh, for somebody that um, was, uh, you know, died on 9-11 and, and uh, one of the, uh, in, on one of the planes. And actually, he was on the phone with his wife, and she said, "I don't, you know, I don't think we're going to get out of this." And and this is a very actually, you know, interesting guy. Um, and the priest was giving the eulogy, and what he did is he turned to her and said, "You know, I bet you thought that nobody, that nobody, understood how you felt in that moment." that you have nowhere, you're on the phone with your wife and she's about to die and that you, you felt completely helpless. And he said, the blessed mother knew that. And that's the power of the transformation that occurs with these stories that you start to think of. Now you're thinking about it, the magnitude of this, that Christ uh, had you know, set his son to die for our sins and that that is that is truly transformative and it's the one of my favorite lines is when we're talking about taking up the cross and understanding that is um what uh oh and it, it was it was actually echoed by saint thomas more too um but what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose their very self and and that's what it means to sacrifice if you lose your soul in the process then then it's not it's not worth it and it's the same thing and this goes to the depth and and this is one of the beautiful transitions that i in my life that why stoicism means so much to me and and it's so important for stoics to maintain their character in that process because it's the self, that is who you are. That's what you believe, that's virtue. And that is virtue is only good. And so God sent his only son is the ultimate virtue. So, um, you know, the, there, there, we, I think we can walk through this and go through this on a couple of different levels, like the, the you know, the, the, the three falls you know, that we can, you know, we can go through the garden of Gethsemane. We can go through the words, you know, why have you forsaken me? But when I think about the cross, uh, this is what it meant to me every year, is that God sent his only son and surrendered, and surrendering yourself to, to God's, well, God's will and, and to what you believe to be right, what you truly believe in yourself to, be, to move forward. And um, that allowed me, in many cases, uh, to do the right thing, uh, even as a little child, that, that would be something that would allow me to actually move forward and say, you know, uh, I was often uh, friends with people that would be ostracized or things along those lines. And my faith was so deep, it was something that, uh, you know, in growing up, uh, that I looked at it from that perspective. I said, not only is it, you know, the right thing to do, it was something in, intuitively that I knew it was the right thing to do. Um, but, but it's also the fact that I understood what Christ had given up and what it really meant to sacrifice. So I think that this is some of these things that, uh, uh, that it, it's why it's so transformative. And that's why the death and resurrection to me uh, is, is important. Uh, okay, that was done really completely kind of off the cuff. So I, I wish I could have gotten a little more philosophical with it. Uh, but anyway. Joe, that was, that was beautiful. That was beautiful, immensely powerful, because I think you captured the meaning of it uh, amazingly well. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Um, Evanique, you had a quick comment uh, before we go to Claire. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, just when Joe was talking about um, the sacrifice of Jesus, I think 
it answered a question that I had on Tuesday night about what sacrifice God had to do. And um, I just like the mother Mary, I think the hardest thing for God was to do nothing while his son is being tortured, knowing that he could stop it, that he had the power and the ability to stop it and not doing it because of us. And I think that is the true power of the cross is that God, like you said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Think about it. You see this torture, you could stop it, but you choose not, you choose not to because you're trying to save us as individual souls. And these souls are the same ones that are torturing your son. And that, you know, and, and that are like talking trash about him. That's the sacrifice of God. It's not doing anything while that is coming on. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> that, that was wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Evanique. Um, I mean, the thing that really kind of remains is still reverberating with me, but the jo what Joe said was the transformative power of somebody saying that, I believe this is right. This is true. This is right. And I will pay the price for doing it. And it is, it could be a terrible price, very difficult. You will say, is there a way of getting around it? And you will say, no, there isn't. And then you take, you know, you take the price, you let parts of you die. Um, and that is what it takes to do the transformation. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Next up is Claire, uh, Maritza, and Jacob. Uh, if anybody else would like to share, you're welcome to do that. Go ahead and type exclamation mark. Claire. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm also reflecting on Joe's points, and it's really moving, and it made it really sort of personal for me, I think. Um, so much of the sort of like Petersonian reflection on this story is a lot about responsibility, carrying your cross in the face of inequality. And I think that's what I really understood it as before, but hearing this and just sort of reflecting on where I am right now and ideas that I've been thinking of, um, it makes me think a lot about self, self will and even self knowledge. And I think that I, um, and I think you guys might relate to this, you know, I spend a lot of my time sort of self-help booking my way to a better future and overthinking. I've spent a lot of time in my head and that puts me as sort of the main character in my movie, which is not reality, right? Um, and so I think, you know, what you were saying, Joe, just really made me realize that a lot of this story is, um, surrender of self-will, even self-knowledge, like that doesn't get me very far. In fact, that often gets me to a worse position than if I just meditate and live in the moment and think of how I can be of service to other people. Um, and I think particularly for Jesus, who is someone who spent years preaching of these ideals you know, this is a story in which he had to stop thinking, stop talking, stop preaching, do an action and, you know, give everything up to the will of God. Um, and I think that that uh, is a great sort of lesson to take throughout life in those moments where we want to control, you know, that sort of dichotomy of control comes up for a little bit for me too, of, you know, this is, you know, this is out of my hands. There's not a lot of free will here. Um, I wanted to reflect on the my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, and as I was reading a little bit about it, it sounds like that line is also the beginning of Psalm 22, which I didn't know. Um, or maybe I knew it and I forgot it. That's probably true. Um, a lot of, I feel like so much of the story when someone explains it to you, it's the opposite of how you read it, right? Or there's some other meaning. Um, but I guess Psalm, Psalm 22, it starts with that line. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. But it goes on to really tell the story of sort of like the, the savior of the Israelites. And it comes full circle and it talks about um, sort of this Messiah figure and the trust in God really say, you know, saving the people, saving the land. Um, and so I think that this, this line does a lot that we think, 
like, yeah, dude, if I were on that cross, I'd be like, what, you know, what, why am I here? Why are you so far from me? Why are you putting me through that pain? And that's true. But perhaps also he was just citing the fact that this is all, this is part of the plan. Um, and I, you know, and I see that the pain of it, but I also see how this leads to that, that sort of salvation. Um, there's a great quote by Pope Benedict, if I could just read quickly. Um, Jesus is praying the great psalm of suffering, Israel. And so he was taking upon himself all the tribulation, not just of Israel, but of all those in this world who suffer from God's concealment. He brings the world's, ang the world's anguish cry at God's absence before the heart of God himself. He identifies himself with suffering Israel and with all who suffer under God's darkness. He takes their cry, their anguish, all their helplessness upon himself. And in doing it, he transforms it. Um, so it, so it so sounds like a, a line of weakness. Um, but it, you know, if you, if you understand that context and probably people knew, knew Psalm 22 by heart. And so they knew that this was calling to that. You really see that, you know, while he's crying out in this agony, he's all also fulfilling the scripture in that line. And he's fulfilling the whole story. Um, and that, that is all is meant to be, uh, a really good ending, right? Like a really good ending to the story. And then also sort of a, a sign of hope. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Claire, that quote was just amazing. Could, could you put that in the chat? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next up is going to be Maritza followed by Jacob. Maritza. I actually have that uh, Psalm uh, 22 uh, one written down in my notes as well. Um, so I'm going to back up from that for a little bit. It was interesting to look at this solely at the sections that you identified, she can't, because usually you remember the story as the whole, but when, um, when you look and focus just on the pieces um, that you um, put out there for us, you kind of get a slightly different picture of it when you're looking at it in that way. Um, so I am a product of Catholic school upbringing. So I have you know, read the Bible, walked with the Bible and lived it quite a bit as a child. Um, this uh, reading of these sections would, I will admit, it would be my first time reading it in several, several years. Um, something that stuck out to me for, it was in Matthew 26, when, he's, when Jesus is struggling with his faith and his disciples keep falling asleep. Um, he's, you know, he keeps going back to them and even when he's chastising them for, for falling asleep, they, they, they can't seem to stay awake. I really like the way Victor put it, the, this idea that we ourselves, even when we, we know something that is very important, you know, we may be prone to closing our eyes against it. I thought that was really interesting. Um, at, the, at, at the very end there of that section, you know, when he tells them, you know, to wake up and his betrayers come and right before he says that, he says, um, the son of man will be delivered into the hands of sinners. And so the, the word sinners has always, always kind of been an emotional word for me. Um, you know, I have a very hard time accepting that by nature of my birth, I am giving this negative title. Um, I mean, and you're giving, the second you're born, it belongs to you, whether you want it or not, you are a sinner. And so I have a very hard time with that. And he puts it there. So um, but when you, when he says it there after watching him struggle and want to run away from his fate, it, it seems to give it a little bit of a softer intonation as it were, because I, I just get the feeling here, like, you know, ultimately he decides, you know, it will be God's will. I am the dutiful son. I am going to honor my father and do his will. So after making that decision and him saying this, that he's going to be delivered into the hands of sinners, I, I almost feel like it's a, it's a matter of 
him viewing this group of beings, these sinners, don't have, they don't have an option. And, and you know, also when you fast forward to Matthew 27, you know, he says, forgive them, they know not what they do, right? Oh, I think he, I think it's Matthew 27. And so that paints the picture of, if I were to extrapolate this from the, the actual literal words in the story, we're being shown that we, or these sinners, are a group of people who cannot see a fate that has already been wrought upon them. Or perhaps, so again, you know, we talk so often about, we, we stand upon the shoulders of our ancestors. And I thought, well, maybe that's the way to look at this. The reason the word sinner is being used, because that's a moniker attached to us based on way back when ancestors, you know, you had the, the, those initial beings in the Garden of Eden took up the mantle of knowledge without understanding. And so if we look at that, then it's a little easy, it was for me a little bit easier to bear as I was looking at it from this perspective, it's like, well, maybe this is all about action and consequence. This entire tale, what I'm looking at here is, you know, Jesus cannot escape this fate. Well, that's not true. He can escape this fate. He willingly chooses not to escape this fate because he believes and his father believes that it is the only way to have the consequence meted for the action taken so long ago and that no one else can accept that mantle. And, and that's enough to give one pause if we look at it from the perspective of, you know, not focusing on Eve taking the apple and remembering that it's this picking up all this knowledge without understanding because, you know, they're afraid now. They didn't understand, but they took all this knowledge in. And so if we extrapolate that today, we are guilty perpetually of this. So many of us, and we really, I don't think anyone can be excluded here. And I, that's an interesting corollary that it's a, we, we ourselves can learn from that, that, this idea that even if it were something way back when it's, if it was an action taken without a consequence accepted, because there were consequences, you know, they were cast out of eating, you know, they have all these other horrible things, but that was not of their choosing. It's not like they accepted a consequence and they accepted their wrong. So we fast forward here, we have this being knowing, full knowing what's going to happen and trembling with that knowledge, fearful of that knowledge and still standing there saying, okay. And that's a really powerful image and it's, it's powerful even when looking at it with a slight tangent to the you know, Christian implica uh, uh, implications. Even, even like it's, it's so powerful, even if you separate from that for the, the idea of a person and self and action versus consequence. Um, that, that what, that's what I got out of that section there. Um, and so for, for Judas, the betrayer, this one little bit, you can't, it's, it's outside of the, the part you told us to read, um, but, it, but you did have us read the part when he said, surely not I. And, but in, in, in Matthew 27, where they describe that Judas hangs himself, the interesting to me was that the priests and the elders tell him, like he's, he's really upset, right? And so he goes to the church and he throws the coins at the church and says, I don't want these. I, I betrayed innocent blood. And the elders say, not, that's not, that's your responsibility, not mine. And instead of accepting responsibility and walking through the rest of his life with that knowledge, he chose the easy path and hung himself. And I see that as stark contrast to Jesus knowing what's going to happen to him and it being a horrible thing. And he still says, okay, I shall. And um, 
that he's uh, so you know because in in where he's on the cross and he's talking you know my god my god why have you forsaken me it it's he's a sin offering right and he who had no sin is to be the sin for us that's heartbreaking in this darkness and it makes one wonder what are we doing in our lives where we're unknowingly and unwittingly causing a situation where someone must come later and bear a consequence for our actions and can we live with that um you know i i just i don't know i just thought that that was a um a slightly different way to um to view that and it's kind of really sadness making as it were but there, there's hope i mean i think it's you know if we can make our peace with that you know there's hope because in matthew 28 right he's he comes back and he says i really like the way he says it he says that um you know he, he's he wants them to be like you he goes i in them and you in me we are one so that they may be brought to complete unity in addition to the fact that it's very poetic and rhymey sounding it's one of those things of so if there is a sequence completed of action and consequence, you know, the sacrifice, consequence being the sacrifice, which Joe, you know, stated so eloquently and beautifully, it allows for the possibility of a unity. And if, if we're remembering that, you know, Jesus here is also the spirit. He's also, the, so if, if he's kind of a spirit of a soul, then, if we can accept that sacrifice, we're going to bring about unity within ourselves. So I, I think it ends on a nice, nice note, despite the darkness of the tale. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Just so many, so many interesting points uh, here. I mean, I'll, I'll focus only on one, uh, and that is that Jesus, who is without sin, chooses to take on sins of others, consequences of thoughts, emotions, and actions of others, and takes them on himself. And what happens is that those people who are used to doing that, they don't feel the sin as much. But a person who is pure, who actually has never experienced that, for them, even a slight amount of untruth, uh, the viciousness, all of that actually hurts a lot. And to take on everything by such a person, that is the maximum amount of agony that can be produced in that moment. And that's why I really like the quote of that uh, Claire brought up because that's exactly what it is. It is, and he's 100% God and 100% human. This is his 100% human speaking of what you have to face in order to transform, in order to transform yourself into good. Um, so thank you. Next up is going to be Jacob. Abraham, uh, Ebenik, and Cho. Jacob. Oh, Jacob is not here. Uh, maybe he will come back again. Uh, Abraham. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's uh, good to be here Saturday afternoon before the Easter. And uh, thank you. Uh, the, while listening, uh these two phrases uh, passages in the bible uh, uh came to me kind of yeah so i want to read this is from john 
chapter 14, 6, we, I think, read at some point together. Jesus answered, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John chapter 14, 6. Uh, another passage, the other passage is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say, what their itching ears want to hear. Uh, so, yeah, Claire's and Mar Marita's uh, notion of uh, the God, God, why did you forsake me? Lama, Lama Sabakdani, I think that's the original passage, the almost last uh, cry. Uh, the when I I I grew up in Christian community and Sunday school, and then I went through puberty, adolescence, and college, and I'm grown up now, right? So it was a simpler and joyful life exuded as it does and then things were like almost like a vague and impressionism what i mean by that is that it looked wonderful but i didn't know what's there but my wish was as i get older as i study more i wished i really aspire i would understand better or more clearly so where I am in my 40s now is that most of things, it didn't happen the way I wanted really. But a few things become really clearer, which means uh, what it means to grieve, mourn. Let's say when your loved one is suffering, when your loved one passed away, what it means as a human or me. When I was a child, I didn't know what it was. When my grandmother passed away, when I was like 12, I didn't cry. I was very sad, but I was bewildered by that. I, my tears are not coming out right away like other family members does. I was really sad. But now when I think about my grandmother, it's not impressionism. It's very clear what she, who she was, how loving she was. Likewise, I think a Jesus story was a story for a long time. But I think for some reason, as I get older, maybe I can see my death more, uh, more closer, right? Everyone dies, we are mortal. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a something after or beyond grief and mourning. It's not the end. So uh, it almost like uh, when we were younger, life was itself good. But as we get older, we see more and more the evidence everywhere. Life is directing toward the point of death. But that horrors us consciously, unconsciously. But I think Jesus, uh, as we uh, Christians say, good news is that that's not the end. That's not the period. I think that's amazing. That's the cross. So uh, it, yeah, that's pretty much. I think uh, Jesus uh, uh, not only said that, he lived through it, and then he was crucified. So I think... Uh, uh, like uh, the, one of the passages I read at the beginning, I think that's quite a relief and that's uh, hope. Not only for myself, for the people and for the people I care for, they, they're suffering. Anyhow, yeah, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Abraham. Appreciate that. Next up is going to be Evanik followed by Cho. Evanik. 
Yeah, uh, I was thinking, I read the uh, Psalm 22 and I forgot how much, like it just tells the whole story from beginning to end in the terms of Jesus being forsaken and it talks about that. And then it talks about, sorry, let me go back to it. Um, you know, sorry, my app is doing something, Never mind. Um, but the point is that like at the end, it tells about the resurrection and what's going to happen after that, you know, the poor are going to eat, you know, um, it also talks about um, in the middle, I think it, I didn't realize how much it related to the crucifixion. And it talks about how, um, you know, yet you were holy and enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our, our ancestors trusted you, you rescued them. They cried out to you and were saved. They trusted you and they were never disgraced. I just think about even after Jesus being forsaken, how much faith he had to keep to know that God was there, even though he couldn't see God for the first time. And even though, he couldn't hear God or he didn't have God near him because he was covered in our sin. Like, you know, he was taking on the sin of the world at that moment. And so going to the end, um, after it talks about everything he has to go through, I wish I had time to read the whole thing, but it says um, that the rich of the world feast and worship, bow before him, all who are mortal, all those all whose lives will end in dust, our children will also serve him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. And I think that's the end and that's the beautiful part of it. So it, like that, thank you, Claire, for that. Cause that scripture, that whole Psalm 22 tells the story of Jesus's torture death resurrection and it's like so that all fu future generations will have that choice to choose god or to not choose god so thank you thank you thank you evanik uh next up is going to be gary followed by cho gary go ahead you can take uh five to ten minutes as much time as you want <laughs> thank you uh, I'm sorry I arrived late. I just saw the, uh, the invitation just now. Um, and it's, it's, it's all very appropriate because um, last night was the first night of uh, Passover. And are you able to hear me all just fine? Yes. Good. And so uh, there was a synagogue in town. And so uh, they have a communal service. And so I was able to attend. And if you're not familiar with the Passover service, it's a three hour process where you retell the entire Exodus story in this context. And, um, and the significant element is that, you know, presumably a, a proto Passover meal is where Jesus was at the last supper when he instituted the concept, this is the new covenant in my blood. Um, you know, and then talks about and institutes the establishment of the, of the Eucharist. And so there's, there's a sense in which the whole Passover meal is a prefigurement of the death and the resurrection of Christ, which is itself a retelling of the exodus from Egypt, which talks about the whole notion of slavery and humanity's condition of slavery. And so we're talking about redemption, not just of the Jewish people, but at the, on this cosmic scale for all of humanity. Um, and so anyhow, I'm, I'm captured by, by a lot of this. Um, some of the work that I was I was doing at school actually is a reminder that um, by the time the Gospels are written, um, Christian tradition had already existed for a good forty years after the death of Christ, and so there's this this tradition that's an oral tradition that hasn't been yet formulated into a into a written gospel. But when we read um, the Epistles of Paul. Like those are the oldest testimonies that we have. And he talks about the death of Christ. He talks about the resurrection. And so he talks about the theological importance to all of this stuff. And when you were talking about Psalm 22, I, which I really like to, I was actually reminded of um, Paul's reflection. Um, is it okay if I read that, even though it's not part of the scripture? 
please, uh, please take your time. You can read anything that you want. You can take up to 20 minutes. That's go ahead. <laughs> no, I don't yeah. So it's, um, this is what they call the kenosis uh, section, the doctrine of, of God emptying himself into human form. And so it, in, uh, in Philippians 2, it's, um, he talks about having the example. It says, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself to the form, uh, emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found as appearance of a man, humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Um, and for this reason, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. Um, and even though the verse continues on, I'll, I'll stop there. But for me at that kenosis, that's Psalm 22, is when he humbles himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. That is, that is the, the human fight that we all experience every day of this utter alienation from the divine, where we're wondering where God is in our prayer when things feel so empty and whatnot. And in that moment, Jesus is there on the cross shouting, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so there's this this uh, later on it talks about how we can empathize with jesus because he's experienced everything all the temptations that we have even to that point of, of utter abandonment and, and isolation um it is important that like psalm 22 and right here they both equate equate it with the concept of glory um and in john's gospel we see that is that talks about the hour is coming the hour of the Son of Man to be glorified, and that hour is equated with the actual sufferings. So in chapter 12, you know, there's that great moment where he sets his face to Jerusalem, and he's heading on there, and he makes the declaration, now is the hour for the Son of, literally says it, now is the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified, you know, and the loud booming voice comes from the heavens, and, and from this point on, it's all about the death and resurrection, um, but it's, it's, significant that the glory that he receives is not what we think of as glory that this kingly victorious whatnot the glory that he receives is all manifested uh through his sufferings and so it, it really kind of turns on its head at least in the christian in the christian concept you know new testament theology is how much god is glorified you know through through our weakness really through that it's not it's it's kind of upside down in a way is, is, is what's what's taking place there for for me and this is something i, I talked talk previously to a different group about um the eucharist meal that takes place at passover in the gospel of john is missing you know he's not there saying this is the sign of the new covenant or any of that but he uses the same Eucharist language. Um, instead of saying new covenant, it says here's a new command, love one another as I have loved you. And instead of the ordinance of communion, there's like this ordinance of washing each other's feet. And so it, there's a sense in John, which is probably the latest of the four gospels, is kind of commenting on the Institute of the Last Supper and the way we understand it and rephrasing it back to this kenosis idea of this emptying of this suffering of this servitude and how we emulate jesus by taking on this form of service and i'm not going to belabor i'm not going to go any further because from wow. that but i hope wow. hope that makes sense or that's clear that was amazing and beautiful and very deep thank you thank you um i let's go with um next up I'm sorry, I've, I've lost everybody here. Uh, Joe followed by Claire, Joe. I, I was willing to listen for another 20 minutes, actually, if, if you were willing to, to give it, uh, Gary, that was, that was phenomenal. Um, uh, I just wanna really briefly connect one, uh, something very important uh, about the, the the understanding of sacrifice, the death and resurrection, and and what we've talked about with the Gita and as well in Christianity, 
is that the ability to see uh, the God in everyone or to see everybody as a child of God. Because once you make that transformation, once you make that leap and, and you're able to see that, it makes the sacrifice that much more, I'm not gonna say easy, but it much more meaningful in the sense that you're able to say that it's worth it. You know, whatever it's gonna cost me, it's worth it. And that's the beauty of being able to see everybody as a child of God or see the God in everyone. And, and, and doing that through, that's why it's been really transformative going through this process, uh, studying the Gita simultaneously with you know the gospel john and 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 the bible so i i i just wanted to add that aspect of it because it's a very very powerful concept if you truly do the inner work that you see yourself um and you start to see your role in the world as well uh and and everything else has a lot more meaning uh and everybody else you start to it transforms how you see god and everything anyway just thought i would add that uh, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so now it's going to be Claire. And then I have, I've been working on putting together my own thoughts on this. Um, and I'm going to present uh, my thoughts uh, on that. Um, I want to, I'm, I'm going to kind of step back and look at the picture as best as I can. My familiarity with this is much lower than almost everybody here. So, but I'm going to try uh, to put, put things down and uh, go from there. Uh, Claire, go ahead. Oh, I look forward to that. Um, Gary bringing up Exodus made me think about Exodus. Um, and I, it's really great to pull these parallels to the first, the first book. Um, I was struck when you posted these readings about Matthew 27 and the sort of everything that happens right after Jesus dies and the, the darkness, the veil being broken, there's an earthquake it gets really, really dark. Like I love, first of all, just the drama of that. Um, and also, it, you know, it makes me realize that for people standing there, it was very immediate, potentially it was very immediate after Jesus breathed his last breath that he was right and the son of God had died. Like it, it didn't take until the resurrection because there was this sort of earth shattering, veil breaking, all of the saints came back to life and like walked into the village. That's crazy. Um, and it's very Exodus-esque, like that darkness. It's, you know, that it just, it's so sort of Old Testament-y, sort of the drama of that. And so um, it led me to this quote in Exodus 10, 21, the Lord said to Moses, extend your hand toward heavens that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness that can be felt. So Moses extended his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. No one could see another person, and no one could rise from his place for three days, but the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Um, and so I think, first of all, this light and darkness, you know, there's, there's no truer metaphor. Um, but then again, like calling to that original story, um, and I just love the sort of... Um, you know, how much you can feel that darkness and, and what a sort of real picture that that paints about that moment, you know, after the death of, death of Christ. Right, uh, thank you. Thank you, Claire. 